Hello, this is Rekha Mancad. Um, I am going to be speaking to you today on mitral stenosis for the ASC board review. I am a cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you at the ASC board review course, although I would have liked to have done it in person. Uh, it's still great that I get to be involved in this course, which I have attended in the past and know it's amazing. So I thank the course directors again for their kind invitation. So uh, again, I'm tasked to talk about mitral stenosis and really the echo feedback features of mitral stenosis. I have no relevant financial disclosures and I'm not going to be talking about any off-label usage. Our objectives today, we are going to talk a little bit about the clinical aspects of mitral stenosis. I think it's important because the story along with the echo um, are what you incorporate both clinically and certainly for any board related questions. Um, I, it's unlikely to get an echo with no clinical story behind it. We're going to be talking about the assessment of mitral stenosis by Doppler methods, 2D as well as 3D and talking about some of the pearls and pitfalls of each of those. We're also going to talk a, a little bit about hemodynamic stress echo, and then just very briefly at the end, talk a little bit about mitral annular calcification, which, as all of you know, is uh, not necessarily a new kid on the block, but certainly one that's giving us uh, a lot of cause for concern as far as treatment options. Okay, so mitral stenosis, just a quick uh, look at what this visually looks like. You know, this is called cause called the fish mouth appearance because of the fact that rheumatic mitral stenosis causes commissural fusion like is uh, depicted by this fish mouth. And there again, we see commissural fusion causing this fish mouth deformity. And here's a schematic showing that as well where the commissures are fused causing the opening of the, the valve to look like a, a fish mouth. So what are the, what's the pathophysiology uh, of mitral stenosis or the pathology of it? Well, it's really an obstruction to LV inflow. Uh, it's pretty obvious at the level of the mitral valve. This mitral valve has an impaired opening during that diastolic filling of the LV where the leaflets don't open fully and therefore there's a, an obstruction to that inflow. This is uh, classically described as a sequelae of rheumatic fever, although we see a lot of patients who don't give that history of rheumatic fever prior. Other inflammatory conditions may also give you a similar look to the mitral valve. We call it post-inflammatory. Rheumatic fever uh, and the effects of rheumatic fever and mitral stenosis do more commonly affect women, although we're not completely sure why. What are the symptoms? Well, typically you're going to get left-sided uh, heart failure symptoms, even though the LV itself is normal. And that's because the LA pressure is really high because of the obstruction to inflow of the ventricle. So typically patients will be short of breath. It's usually dyspnea on exertion. Rarely will you get rest symptoms unless it's quite severe. Uh, they get orthopnea and PND. You uh, again, if they're in acute heart failure related to this, they can be uh, coughing up bloody sputum. If this progresses to there being significant pulmonary hypertension, you will get right-sided heart failure symptoms. Patients are frequently asymptomatic until something tips them over the edge, one of those things being atrial fibrillation with the loss of, loss of atrial contractility. And again, we do know that certain uh, uh, things that happen during somebody's life other than AFib can also exacerbate the symptoms, one of those being pregnancy and the hemodynamic consequences related to pregnancy can really aggravate mitral stenosis symptomatology. We think of mitral stenosis as a disease of plateaus. So you have rheumatic fever onset in youth or young adulthood. Um, Hopefully that gets treated appropriately, but if not, there's a, a 10 to 15 year lag before you get signs, and then another 10 to 15 year uh, plateau before you start developing uh, neurocard associated class symptoms. And then as the disease progresses, if you get atrial fibrillation, then you get a more acceleration of your symptom profile. Once you have class three or four symptoms develop, the prognosis is pretty grim with a 15% tenure survival with medical therapy alone. So one, we wanna prevent mitral stenosis from ever happening by treating rheumatic fever aggressively and recognizing if there's cardiac involvement and following that patient closely before they ever develop class three or four symptoms. The physical exam, classic physical exam, mitral stenosis, this is a general cardiology board 
question, but again, important to recognize the opening snap and the low pitched diastolic rumble in the stem of a, of a clinical history. A first heart sound can be loud, although as the mitral stenosis severity progresses, the uh, S1 can actually get soft. And we see here as the mitral stenosis severity is more severe, the left atrial pressure is higher. This causes the diastolic rumble, rumble to be throughout diastole, and the opening snap gets closer to the second heart sound. But again, recognizing that that opening snap potentially can disappear in really severe mitral stenosis. The S2 uh, opening snap interval is inversely related to the severity of the mitral stenosis. That's what I just showed you. So the closer, closer the opening snap gets to the second heart sound, the more severe the mitral stenosis is. And if you wanted to listen to that, here's a link to what that sounds like. The other things on physical exam, you get this malar flush. It almost looks like a patient with lupus, but they get this ruddiness to their cheeks and even their nose. It's a pinkish purplish patch on the face and the cheeks. More severe mitral stenosis can actually give you peripheral cyanosis. Again, pretty rare to see uh, nowadays as we usually recognize mitral stenosis well before this. Uh, again, because of the pulmonary hypertension that can develop, you can see jugular venous distension. Because, again, of pulmonary hypertension, a loud second heart sound, typically the P2 component, and then other evidence of right heart failure with an RV lift, ascites, and edema, and having those uh, clearly are ominous signs. What about on an EKG? Well, you get this uh, evidence of left atrial enlargement uh, with this negative deflection of the P wave in V1. Again, here's P mitrale. So findings on EKG that will guide you to the fact that this person might have mitral stenosis, which is causing a large left atrium. We can see that on chest x-ray as well. Here's the enlarged left atrium along the left heart border. And then evidence of right heart enlargement can also be seen if there's concomitant pulmonary hypertension. Now we're really going to get to the, the more important parts of this and why you're here, especially if you're going to be taking the echo boards. But really, echocardiography is the mainstay in mitral stenosis evaluation, both for making the diagnosis and quantifying the severity, and then looking for features to determine how best to treat that mitral stenosis and whether the, uh, to see if the patient is a candidate for balloon valvuloplasty. So here's a, just a, a case just to show you what this valve looks like. This is a 50 year four-year-old female with a known history of rheumatic fever who presents with dyspnea on exertion and New York Heart Association class three symptoms with PND and orthopnea. Here we have the parasternal long axis view and here the same parasternal long with color. And here is that classic appearance to the mitral valve in rheumatic heart disease uh, with this doming that we see here, a uh, hockey stick appearance again. And again, by color, we can see here on diastole as the ventricle is filling, this flow acceleration is happening because of the obstruction to filling. Again, to point out that doming of the anterior leaf of the mitral valve, it's better seen on that anterior leaflet. That's the longer uh, leaflet. So we see that hockey stick appearance. The posterior leaflet here, you can tell, is not moving very well. Uh, and again, we call it that hockey stick appearance. Be careful saying that to people who have no idea what hockey is. They'll, have, uh, they'll look at you very confused if you say that their valve looks like a hockey stick. And again, here it is by color flow. Um, classically, again, before we had 2D, M mode was the way the diagnosis was made. And again, uh, it's a nice, easy thing for uh, imaging exams to look at uh, the mitral valve on um, uh, M mode echocardiography. And here we see that the mitral valve anterior leaflet right here has lost his E wave and A wave, and this person is in sinus rhythm. And we see this thickened leaflet with this flattening of the E and A. So the slope here, there's a singular slope, and you can see the opening of the valve is reduced. But what do we do mostly? We're not doing um, M-mode to determine the severity. Um, we are looking at the gradients and valve area by 2D methods, transthoracically, and by TEE. The different uh, measurements that we get on echocardiography, again, mean gradient. We can do planimetry on the valve pressure halftime, which allows us to calculate mitral valve area as well. There's some color Doppler methods, which uh, 
our PISA as one, and then continuity and methods as well. And we'll talk about um, when to use these and, and uh, what the pitfalls might be to using some of these. And this is just a still frame, again, showing the obstruction uh, across the mitral valve of flow into the LV. So mitral valve area by planimetry, I, it's surprising how uh, infrequently I see this being done, but this really is, a, 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 I wouldn't say necessarily quick, but it's a method that's going to help you with the other methods that uh, we're going to talk about. You know, you want to be able to see this valve short axis, so this is from the peristernal short, and really this gives you a sense of the leaflets, uh, anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet, the commissural calcification, but gets you this opening where you want to see the smallest opening and you can trace this. And this is actually um, not a bad way to assess mitral valve area and should be one that you do routinely for your mitral stenosis uh, cases because it's a direct measurement of that mitral valve area. But there are other methods, um, and we'll talk about the planimetry again, but we do want to talk about the pressure halftime, and Dr. Liv Hatley is one of the pioneers to uh, talk about this and published this in 1978, where she non-invasively assessed the pressure drop in mitral stenosis by Doppler ultrasound, uh, although the concept had first been described a decade before that. What is pressure halftime? It is the time required for the velocity to drop to half the peak pressure. So when you're talking about uh, pressure half time across the mitral valve, again, the uh, flow across the mitral valve, we're looking for the time required for that peak pressure to drop to half of that. And that's the pressure half time. How do we use the pressure half time? Well, 220 divided by the pressure half time uh, gives you the mitral valve area. Now be careful because you can have a deceleration time. That's this whole, slope here, the deceleration time, that is not the pressure half time. If you get a deceleration time, you have to multiply it by 0.29 to get the pressure half time. So just uh, be uh, conscientious of whether a deceleration time is being mentioned or a pressure half time. Now here's a, a, a look of a uh, uh, mitral stenosis case, and I know you can hear a little bit of audio related to that, but here is the LV LA, and here we see the Doppler profile of the mitral stenosis. That mean gradient that was obtained, if we trace this, was four millimeters of mercury. The pressure half time method gave us a mitral valve area of 1.2 squared centimeters. So when we think about that, a mean gradient of four is not very high, but a, a valve area of 1.2 is in the severe category, and we'll talk about uh, the criteria for severity a little bit later. But the question is, uh, do those things match up? So when we look at this alignment that was obtained for the mean gradient and the pressure half time, this was how that uh, those numbers were obtained. Now you can see here that the flow from the LA to the LV is actually along this line. So that Doppler angle was a bit suboptimal. So I ask you, if you see this, how do you think that that suboptimal Doppler angle affects the mitral valve area by pressure half time? Will it overestimate the mitral valve area? Will it underestimate the mitral valve area? Or won't it do anything to the mitral valve area? So again, the alignment was suboptimal. We're not in parallel to flow. We have, we've introduced an angle here. How will it affect the mitral valve area by pressure half time? Well, actually, it doesn't do anything to the mitral valve area. And why is that? Well, because that decay is actually not affected by the suboptimal alignment. The gradient will be affected. So that is why our mean gradient in this case was only four millimeters of mercury. But the actual pressure half time uh, that you get would be the same whether you were in this suboptimal alignment or in the optimal alignment. Because again, you're looking for the time it takes for the pressure to decay by half. So although the peak pressure will be lower and the mean gradient will be lower, the pressure half time will be similar. And that was shown by this study where it uh, looked at the Doppler angle of in, uh, incidence and it showed that it was not influenced. 
it did not influence the mitral valve area. So whether you had, uh, you were lined up uh, right along the flow or if you introduced an angle, it did not change the mitral valve area that was obtained. But again, like I said, the mean gradient would be affected. Now let's look at this where we have a, um, a, a mitral inflow that has a couple of different uh, decelerations. Where should we draw the pressure half time? Should it be here? Should it be here? Or do you pick something in the middle where you take that peak at the E wave and go here to the nadir? Which should it be when we're determining pressure half time? It should be this majority signal here, not that initial slope. Now, this would be important if we're talking about uh, trying to assess uh, diastology or filling pressures. But for the pressure half time for the valve, we want to extract, we, we, we want to use this second uh, a slope for the pressure half time. And that's seen here in a live uh, mean gradient look. So here's the mean gradient, which is nine millimeters of mercury. But we do not want to take this first drop. We want to take the second drop. And that's what we would use for our pressure half time calculation. Uh, this is another case, a 62-year-old female with a history of rheumatic fever who's short of breath with New York Heart Association class three symptoms. PND or end orthopnea. And we see here the mitral valve, and it looks rheumatic, but she has coexisting aortic regurgitation. I'm not going to ask you to quantify how much that is, but there does seem to be significant aortic regurgitation. So then I ask you, what's the effect of aortic regurgitation on mitral valve area calculated by pressure half time? No effect, an overestimation of the mitral valve area or an underestimation of the mitral valve area. What's gonna happen in the setting of aortic regurgitation on mitral valve area if you're using the pressure half time? There's actually, and we'll talk about this in detail, but in general, we would say that there's an overestimation of the mitral valve area. Why is that? Well, because the pressure half time will be lower. In this particular patient, that mitral valve looked very stenotic and she had a mean gradient of 20 millimeters of mercury at a heart rate of 72, so really high. But the mitral valve area by pressure half time was 2.5 centimeters. That doesn't make a lot of sense. That's a, a pretty big mitral valve area. And yet there was a gradient of 20 millimeters of mercury in somebody who clinically had evidence of significant mitral stenosis by her uh, symptoms. So when we look at aortic regurgitation and uh, mitral stenosis, there was actually some controversy uh, early on. There were studies that showed various things. One said that aortic regurgitation lengthened the pressure half time and therefore underestimated mitral valve area. There was others that said it shortened the uh, pressure half time, therefore overestimating the mitral valve area. And then others that said there was no effect at all. And these were in uh, the 80s uh, that there was all these studies uh, published in great journals that said three completely different things. Dr. Graeber and Dr. Demaria did this study where they looked at pressure halftime in patients with concomitant aortic regurgitation, and they showed that there was really no difference. So uh, whether you had um, mild, none to mild aortic regurgitation versus moderate to severe aortic regurgitation, the correlation was pretty good that it didn't seem like it had an effect in this particular study. Well, another study done just a few years later actually said that aortic regurgitation overestimated the valve area. And here there's no aortic regurgitation, and here there is patients with aortic regurgitation. And they found that if you had aortic regurgitation, your pressure half time got shorter, overestimating the mitral valve area, which was confirmed by planimetering the valve. So this was mitral valve area by direct planimetry compared to the mitral valve area obtained by Doppler uh, assessment. So that in this study, it showed that you overestimated. But it gets a bit more complex than that. It's not just one or the other. We have to think about the compliance of the ventricle. And they looked at this further. This was an in vitro study 
where they had a fixed mitral valve area of one centimeter squared, and they adjusted the compliance of the ventricle. And they found that a non-compliant ventricle, so a very stiff heart that had aortic regurgitation, had a very short uh, um, pressure half time, and therefore there could very much be an overestimation of the uh, area. As the ventricle got more compliant and large with the aortic regurgitation, it offset that overestimation of the valve area. So it's important to recognize this, that the effect may be more modest. But if you have acute aortic regurgitation in somebody with mitral stenosis, then that could be the, uh, the category where clearly the mitral valve area would be overestimated because that ventricle will have a sudden rapid rise in the pressure during diastole because of the acute aortic regurgitation. So just recognize that. And again, I said we'd get back to planimetry. When you see a gradient of 20 millimeters of mercury like our patient had with a pressure half time, um, uh, getting a valve area 2.5, look at the valve visually and do planimetry. And in this patient, when we did planimetry on that valve, the valve area was 1.2 uh, centimeter squared versus again what we got by planimetry. So clearly this is much closer to what was going on with the patient who had the symptoms and a very high gradient. So just some take-home points about mitral stenosis with coexistent aortic regurgitation. Usually significant aortic regurgitation will result in a shortening of the pressure half time leading to an overestimation of the mitral valve area. However, the overall effect is fairly moderate and a bit unpredictable because of the influences of the LV chamber compliance. Um, so always correlate that mitral valve area by pressure half time by directly looking at that valve and doing planimetry by 2D. Let's just summarize pressure half time methods uh, overall for mitral valve area and some of the pitfalls. Now I told you that the you didn't have to be lined up with flow exactly, that's true. So you could introduce an angle, but if you overall have a, overall have a suboptimal Doppler signal, that can certainly affect your ability to assess uh, pressure half time. If somebody is markedly tachycardic or in atrial fibrillation as described here, that's gonna make the ability to uh, assess that diastolic filling period much more difficult. We talked about the influences of aortic regurgitation. If somebody's left atrial pressure is significantly elevated, this is going to make uh, the ability for pressure half time to tell you the severity a bit more complicated because that LA pressure, particularly in the sinus rhythm, is gonna have this uh, ab abrupt um, uh, initial drop in that flow across that mitral valve. So again, can be, make things much more complicated. Do not use pressure half time to assess mitral valve area right after a balloon valvuloplasty because of those acute changes in LA compliance. So um, you would not use um, pressure half time in that scenario. Again, talked about arrhythmias, also AV block because that alters the timing of atrial contribution. And we talked about that nonlinear pressure decay. Again, use that mid diastolic slope if you can see it. What about the PISA method? We talk about the PISA method for regurgitant lesions, uh, very much so in mitral regurgitation. Can you use it for mitral stenosis? You can because you do get a hemisphere that forms when you have mitral stenosis. And here, a lovely hemisphere that is formed due to the obstruction of flow from the LA into the LV. And we use a similar formula to calculate effective orifice area where we're assessing flow uh, and then we divide it by the peak of velocity across that mitral valve. And there is the radius that's obtained. We plug it in right there and we use our aliasing velocity that we set and then we uh, assess the peak velocity across the mitral valve. And this is what it looks like. Um, so here's the flow 6.28 times that radius squared times the aliasing velocity divided by the peak mitral stenosis velocity. However, this formula to assess um, the area is, uses a hemisphere. And so therefore you should be at 180 degrees. Well, in mitral stenosis, the leaflets don't come down to the annulus. They have this peaked, because again, we're looking at a stenotic lesion, not a regurgitant lesion. So you have an angle that's been introduced. So you have to use an angle correction.
And ideally, you should measure that angle to know exactly what you should plug into this formula. So again, if you're using the PISA method, this is what you need to do is to uh, put in this um, angle correction, which again, if you get out your, your uh, compass, you can measure that angle and here it's 150 degrees. So should you be doing that all the time? Again, if you're a purist, that's the way you should do it. But this is why the PISA method for microstenosis is infrequently used. And again, there is a lot of variables. This radius can be somewhat hard to measure because of the way that flow convergence looks. Here is, again, the radius. The baseline has been shifted in the direction of flow. And here is the angle that we obtain. You take the color off and you measure that angle and you uh, plug it in as I just showed you. Now, can you, I mean, are we all measuring the angles? No. Can you do it simply? You can put in this 100 degree as sort of an arbitrary pick. Can we just pick that can, and that therefore simplify it? And you can see here that it's not bad. And certainly if you wanted to avoid measuring each of these angles every time, you could use this 100 degrees knowing that it's not perfect, but it gives you sort of a quick uh, assessment of the valve area. But again, would not do the PISA method as the only method, uh, particularly if you have a good pressure halftime and somebody in sinus rhythm, that's going to be your better, better method. What about the continuity equation? Uh, again, we use this for regurgitant lesions often, but it can be used for mitral stenosis as well. But you have to remember that you can't use it if you have um, significant mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation, which is uh, usually not the case. Rheumatic uh, mitral valve disease, although it gives you mostly mitral stenosis, because of those retracted leaflets, there's usually some mitral regurgitation as well. So if it's more than mild mitral regurgitation, if it's moderate or greater, you can't use the continuity. And if the aortic valve is affected from rheumatic disease and you have more than mild aortic regurgitation, you could not use this formula. But essentially what we're doing is we're looking at flow out of the LV outflow tract, looking at the dimension, the LV alpha tract dimension, looking at the TBI across the LV alpha tract, so this is our stroke volume, and then the mitral inflow um, gradient, uh, uh, VTI uh, in the denominator. Again, not something we use a lot. I'll just go back to that quickly. Look at how many different measurements you need. So again, just like the continuity equation in other valvular issues, there is more potential for mistakes because of all the different uh, measurements that you need. So I, we mentioned mean gradient several times, but so we're kind of going a little bit backwards, but we do need to talk about mean gradient, but to recognize that because mitral stenosis is a diastolic problem, the mean gradient is very much dependent on heart rate. So when you report a mean gradient on an echocardiogram in mitral stenosis, you really need to uh, say what the heart rate was at the time of that measurement. Because tachycardia will, uh, by shortening your diastolic filling, is going to raise that mean gradient. So very important to recognize um, that heart rate influence. Also things that affect cardiac output. So if somebody is markedly anemic, they can also increase their gradients and if there's significant mitral regurgitation. So all of those are important uh, uh, things to recognize as you assess the mean gradient. This um, is the current um, valve guidelines so when we talk about severity. Now, prior to these guidelines, the severity of the mitral stenosis was actually based on the mean gradient. Now we know that that mean gradient can range anywhere from five to 10 millimeters of mercury in the setting of severe mitral stenosis. So the gradient isn't the primary player, it's actually the mitral valve area. And that number has changed it as well. So a mitral valve area of less than or equal to 1.5 squared centimeters is what constitutes severe mitral stenosis. It used to be less than one. Very severe is now less than one. That typically is with gradients anywhere from five to 10 millimeters of mercury or even higher. Um, you'll have left atrial enlargement, evidence of elevated right ventricular systolic pressures, typically over 30 millimeters of mercury. So again, important to recognize that valve area dictates severity, not the gradient. 
Now, since we're saying that valve area dictates the severity, that's why that planimetry of the valve and uh, really looking at the opening of the valve is so important. So you can use 3D echo, and this is a great utilization of 3D echo, particularly on transthoracic imaging, to assess mitral valve area. And why it's really nice is because you can make sure that you are at the narrowest orifice by 3D echo. You can tell here that if you were down here on the left atrial side of this, you could have a very large mitral valve area. But if you uh, put your cursors right at the leaflet tips, you can get a really good lineup at the smallest orifice and then trace that, which we see here where we're cutting at the smallest orifice. And again, you can scroll through on those 3D planes to see where it's the smallest and then trace that valve area at the time. Now, depending on how you do these valve areas, we talk about 2D planimetry. We have 3D guided that I just showed you, uh, pressure halftime, PISA, and the Gorlin, uh, which is the valve area calculated in the cath lab is considered uh, the gold standard. How do all of these methods look? Well, really, we see that the best is the 3D assessment from the LV side. And why from the LV side? Well, because that's the spot where you can get that smallest orifice. And looking down here, we see that if you compare mitral valve area by pressure half time in Gorlin, there is, this is the uh, two standard deviations. We see quite a range. It gets better when we use 2D planimetry, but when we have 3D guided uh, planimetry, um, particularly from the LV side, we see the best correlation. And you can see here how close it is. So uh, again, a nice use uh, on transthoracic imaging for uh, 3D echocardiography. What else do we want to look at when we're looking at the valve? So we talked about assessing the severity. Well, we want to know if this valve can be intervened upon by balloon valvioplasty. So you want to look at the amount uh, of calcification on the valves, in the commissures, in the subvalvular apparatus. So this is the Abascal score that we can give um, a valve to see how much um, how, what's the likelihood of uh, being able to do a, a val balloon valvuloplasty and what our success will be. So we have a couple of different criteria. We look at mobility of the valve, subvalvular thickening, thickening of the leaflets and calcification. And the less mobile the valves are, the more thick they, the, the, val the subvalvular apparatus and the valves and the calcification, the worse that valve is as far as being able to respond uh, to balloon valvuloplasty without a complication. So typically a score of less than eight has a more favorable outcome for balloon valvuloplasty. Uh, this was a study done uh, from here, now several years ago, looking at the Abascal score. And actually that score uh, was not felt to be uh, whether it was greater than eight or less than eight, didn't seem to really help. The p-value was non-significant, but what did help was calcification. So I think a lot of us now don't necessarily do a score, although we look at all those parameters, but what we're really looking for is commissural calcification. Because as I, we talked about, rheumatic mitral valve disease affects those commissures, and the best way to get that mitral valve to be bigger is to crack that calcification in the commissures to open up that valve further. If there is no calcification there, then your balloon is not going to be able to open up that um, that uh, valve. Um, and again, uh, we want to be able to, to open it, but we, we want to see how much that calcification is and whether it's asymmetric. If there's no calcification, it's just thickened, we can open it up. If there's calcification, again, we can crack it, but we want to see if it is um, asymmetric. So if you have calcification on one side, but not the other, if you have it in the leaflets, uh, this all impacts the, the likelihood for balloon valvuloplasty to work and, and not have a complication. And this is a look at uh, commissural and leaflet calcification. So we see here by 2D echo, you can see calcification in the commissures. But then if you do uh, 3D TEE, this is from the LV view, yes, there is clearly commissural calcification, but look at all the calcification in the leaflet here. So this valve, if you balloon it, you don't know if you're gonna just crack the commissures or whether you're gonna do something to those leaflets. So this is a much 
riskier um, undertaking for balloon valvoplasty. Um, this looks at breaking those commissures. Again, if you just have thickening, it's a little easier to crack those, but this is a, a valve that's at baseline. This is where it's been stretched. Here's where one commissure is broken, and here's where two, both sides uh, have been broken. And if you look at uh, how well the patients do, well, if you can open both of those commissures, you get a bigger valve area that's in group three that where you were able to do both medial and lateral commissures were uh, uh, broken. You get a bigger valve area with a lower gradient. So that's what we're hoping to achieve with balloon valvuloplasty. And again, if you're able to do that, the likelihood of death or needing heart surgery is much lower versus if you only stretch them and aren't able to break those commissures, these patients have a higher likelihood of needing to have open uh, valve procedures uh, and they have a higher likelihood of death as well. Now, this is a, now a study um, over a decade ago from our good friends, Dr. Sugang and Dr. Roberto Lang, showing us again, uh, using real-time 3D TTE, TTE to um, see the success of balloon valvoplasty. So this is the baseline imaging. This is after one in blue balloon inflation where, the, again, the valve looks bigger, but the commissures don't seem to be any different. And here's with a second balloon inflation where both commissures are broken here and here. But then look at this here. What's happened there? Unfortunately, that's a tear of the posterior leaflet. And we could see that there's some calcification down here and that likely is what tore. So this patient would have uh, perforation of that leaflet and mitral regurgitation related to that. Um, again, a view from the LV perspective, looking at a stenotic mitral valve and we see a still frame pre-balloon valvoplasty and here's post with one of those commissures successfully broken. Uh, let's talk about one more aspect. This is courtesy of my friend, Dr. Nakomo, a 48-year-old ace. She was feeling fine. She came for just a general medical evaluation with some uh, non-cardiac symptoms, but she does report that her valves leaked when she was young. In the internal medicine uh, arena, this was her exam. It was really unremarkable. She had a chest x-ray that maybe showed a little bit of right heart enlargement, Perhaps some left atrial enlargement. It's a little bit tricky here. The right heart does look prominent. Here's her EKG, sinus rhythm. Nothing too abnormal. She comes for an echocardiogram because of this history. And we now see the problem. We see a very abnormal mitral valve. It has that hockey stick appearance. It looks rheumatic in nature, a severely dilated left atrium, and significant obstruction to inflow with some mitral regurgitation. Her mean gradient was 13 millimeters of mercury and her heart rate was only 74 beats per minute. The mitral valve area by pressure half time was 1.2 squared centimeters and her right ventricular systolic pressure was 39 millimeters of mercury. So this was her echo findings, the summary, rheumatic mitral stenosis, significant mitral, uh, significant sig mitral stenosis with mild mitral regurgitation, and just as we described. So now she gets sent to a cardiology and here's her physical exam after the echo. She now has a loud S1 with an increased P2 and an opening snap um, and a short rumble. None of these things had been heard prior, but say la vie. So now what would you do? The patient says, I feel fine. I have no problems. Do you observe her? She's asymptomatic, get another echo in a year. Do you do a TEE? Uh, do you do an exercise uh, stress echo? cat the patient or refer her for balloon valvoplasty. Well, really what you should be doing here is exercising this particular patient. And why is that? Well, there's a discordance between what she says she feels and her echo. And a current valve guidelines say, give a class one recommendation for exercise uh, testing with Doppler or invasive hemodynamic assessment. So you can do it in the cath lab to evaluate the response of that mean gradient and pulmonary pressures in a patient with uh, mitral stenosis when there's a discrepancy between the resting Doppler uh, findings and clinical signs or symptoms. So in her, we had a, a, a echo that showed severe mitral stenosis, but she was asymptomatic. But you could also have it the other way where the patient is uh, symptomatic and the resting echo doesn't show any um, significant uh, findings. That's the more common 
uh, way that we would typically see things where the patient said they're very symptomatic, but the echo doesn't show severe mitral stenosis. Because again, um, we know that typically mitral stenosis gives symptoms with activity more than at rest. In mitral stenosis, again, symptoms and pulmonary hypertension do predict a poor outcome. The degree of stenosis at rest may not reflect the true severity of obstruction with exercise. And we have to remember that that pressure gradient is very much a, a, a function of flow and then that diastolic filling period. This is not our particular patient, but what we're looking for on a, a stress echocardiography is the change in the mean gradient. We do expect the gradient to go up because we are increasing heart rate, but we're also looking for pulmonary hypertension to develop with uh, RV uh, function changes or RV dysfunction. And then this particular case, we see that the RV gets dysfunctional. Here we can see the RV is, gets big, and we see right here a flattening of the ventricular septum. We see it here as well, showing evidence of significant pulmonary hypertension with exercise um, and RV dysfunction. Our particular patient, uh, she did a uh, bi bicycle, and this is what we saw. Her gradient at rest was 10 millimeters of mercury on the stress echo. At 25 watts, it went up to 25. At 50 watts, it went up to 33, and at 75 watts, the gradient across her mitral valve went to 37 millimeters of mercury. Concomitantly, her RBSP at rest, 30 millimeters of mercury, 25 watts, 56, 50 watts, 74, and at 75 watts, her RBSP was 100 millimeters of mercury. And she did get short of breath here. So clearly, it was far, uh, it was quite uh, significant changes with. Uh, a bicycle getting just to 75 watts. And it's important to recognize that if the mean gradient goes above 15 or the RBSP goes above 60, that these are high risk features. So this is somebody that despite them saying that they're asymptomatic, you would likely intervene upon sooner. Likely that patient is not very active and that's why they are asymptomatic. Um, so again, to summarize that exercise testing in mitral stenosis, uh, clinical significance of resting hemodynamics is unclear. So a resting echo may not tell you the whole story. And if you have symptoms out of proportion to resting hemodynamics, uh, you certainly want to exercise them. We're gonna just wrap up quickly with mitral annular calcification. This again is something we're seeing more and more of as our population gets older and older, but this doesn't affect the leaflets. This is affecting the annulus. This is a degenerative process in the fibrous base of the mitral valve, and it's clearly associated with increased incidence of cardiovascular disease, arrhythmias, and mortality. And it really influences the outcomes of cardiac surgery and interventions. And unfortunately, this is a condition, if it's severe enough, does not have great outcomes in the surgical world. And this is just a quick case showing you significant mitral annular calcification here. This is the four chamber view showing this shelf of calcium. Here on the short axis, we see this incredible amount of calcification encompassing more than half uh, of the, uh, the uh, annulus of this mitral valve. And you can see the anterior leaflet moves pretty well. And what you see here typically with these patients, their gradient can be high, but you see actually often a smaller E compared to an A wave, different than valvular or rheumatic mitral stenosis. Um, their gradients tend not to be quite as high as rheumatic mitral valve disease, but that's not universal. But again, important to recognize this because this is not a, a valve you would do balloon valvuloplasty on. Surgically, there's poor outcomes. Percutaneously, obviously, this is being looked at for percutaneous options with a valve uh, inside of this mitral annular calcification. An extension, oh, I'm sorry, this is a 3D look at this. That's not uh, the same patient, but a different patient showing you this extensive calcification. There's also calcification here, uh, kind of encroaching on the anterior leaflet in this patient, but this just ridge of calcification in the posterior annulus on 3D TEE. This can sometimes look even worse. This is courtesy of my good friend, Dr. Ora Gemma, who's also speaking at this meeting. This particular patient uh, was referred for a uh, source of embolism, and you see this mass here at the annulus. And this is actually uh, mitral annular calcification that's gone crazy. I call it super MAC, but this is caseating mitral annular calcification. You see this liquefaction in the center. This is pretty significant. You see this more often in patients with renal failure, 
but it can cause embolic phenomena, can cause obstruction to inflow as well. And these, they, they're called toothpaste tumors, and I'll show you why. They can be mistaken for masses. Um, they do have the central area of lucency, and it's actually found in a small portion of autopsies in patients who have this mitral annular calcification. And this is what it, it looks like here in a case with this, this dense, looks like a mass. And why is it called a toothpaste tumor? This video is courtesy of Dr. Lang. And when you look here, you'll see this right here is this caseating MAC. And when the surgeon cuts into this, you'll see this material that looks like toothpaste. And you can, this is why surgeons do not like to take these patients to surgery because this is very sticky and makes valve replacement very, very difficult. So in conclusion, I hope I gave you a, a overview, a pretty in-depth overview of mitral stenosis and ways to approach it by echo. But remember that you really need a multimodal uh, multimodal approach to assessing mitral stenosis by echo. You need 2D imaging, you need 3D imaging, you need color, you need Doppler. Don't rely on a single method. Understand that there's some pitfalls to some of these methods. Really, polymetry and pressure halftime are going to be the mainstays to assess severity, but there's some other options as well. And clearly, uh, have a low yield to do hemodynamic stress tests when symptoms and the echo findings don't match. And remember to really describe the morphology of that valve, uh, how much mitral regurgitation as well, because that's really going to dictate your interventional approach, whether it be percutaneously or surgically. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and if you're taking the boards, good luck.